We all love aeroplanes, me especially. And what I found for you is amazing. This 35mm original footage of the best of British aviation in the 50s when Britain was breaking the sound barrier. Hang on a minute. Britain didn't break the sound barrier. That was done by Chuck Yeager in Glamorous Gladys. Oh no, it wasn't. <laughs> Here's a link to Breaking the Sound Barrier, one of the first films I ever made on YouTube, because I'm so interested in it. Because Britain actually contributed to two major factors of Breaking the Sound Barrier in Glamorous Glanis. And that was, one, the thin Gillette wing, and two, the all-moving powered tailplane. Chuck Yeager was, in fact, a very brave man. He was dropped in a rocket-powered plane with no power assist on any of the control services. He nearly died if it wasn't for Britain, for some reason, giving away all their secrets of the wing shape and the all-flying tail. That would never have happened. Chuck Yeager would not have gone down in history as the first person to break the sound barrier. In fact, he probably wasn't the first person to break the sound barrier. I think lots of people did it in Spitfires in World War II, but they didn't live to tell the tale. One of the problems of breaking the sound barrier is that transition from subsonic to supersonic. There's that transonic region where airflow separates and you get compressibility and shock waves and buffeting. Just revel in this tiny extract of Britain at its best when we actually built decent aircraft and were ahead in building supersonic planes. For you real nerdy engineers out there, there's a link in the description to the full length of these shell training films. But here today is a compilation of some of the most beautifully photographed, amazing supersonic aircraft from the 1950s. Enjoy. In these ways, Designers are gradually solving the problems of transonic flight and building aircraft that are safe at high and low speeds. Many aircraft have already mastered the shock stall and don't suffer from it at all. Others, which for many years to come will be flying transonically around Mark I, are doing so with greatly reduced shock stall effect. Soon, still greater thrust will be available from after-burning jets, ram jets, rocket motors. <laughs> Aircraft whose job it is to fly as fast as possible will be able to pass easily through the transonic range into the steadier and more predictable range of fully supersonic flight. Here's one possible solution for the future. Vertical takeoff. Here's another, an aircraft which has straight wings at low speeds and becomes highly swept for supersonic flight. Shapes like these may well be the supersonic airliners of the future.
Aircrafts designed to approach the speed of sound look different from low-speed aircraft. To find out why, let's first consider how sound itself travels through air. Slowing down the picture shows how the sound is produced. The vibrating prongs give the air a succession of pushes. And like pressure waves along a spring, these sound waves travel on through the air. Let's measure the time it takes for the sound of the explosion to travel one mile, the distance between these two forts. The flash is coming now. One, two, three, four, the sound took just under five seconds to travel the mile. That is, at sea level, the speed of sound is about 760 miles per hour. The ratio of an aircraft's true airspeed to the speed of sound where it is flying is called the aircraft's Mach number, after the 19th century Austrian physicist Ernst Mach. It is usually shortened to M. At high speeds, it is essential for the pilot to know the Mach number, and Mach meters are fitted to all high-speed aircraft. This is how an aircraft's Mach number is calculated. The aircraft has flown six-tenths of a mile in the time that a sound wave has traveled ten-tenths of a mile. It has flown at six-tenths of the speed of sound in the same atmospheric conditions. So its Mach number is 0.6. This aircraft is flying at Mach 0.9. Aircraft flying at the same true airspeed but at different heights will have different Mach numbers. For the speed of sound is different in the two cases. The Mach numbers at which an aircraft is intended to operate have a great influence on its design. An aircraft is much more complicated than the point source of pressure waves we saw earlier. So the behavior of the air is more complicated too. Sweep back, like thin wings, brings its own problems at low speeds, such as tip stalling. So designers must compromise between high speed and low speed requirements and aircraft designed to fly near the speed of sound use thin wings together with sweep back to obtain a high critical Mach number. Various arrangements have been adopted, all very different in appearance. If the swept wing is too thin to contain the engines, they can be mounted externally in pods. Alternatively, the engines can be buried in the wing roots, which are more highly swept than the remainder of the wing. A special kind of sweep back is the crescent wing. Here, the sweep back is reduced in stages to avoid tip stalling. The delta wing combines a high degree of sweep back and great strength. Delta's large wing area makes it very maneuverable and gives it a good performance at high altitudes. The simple delta shape can have many variations. Some deltas have a tail plane to improve maneuverability at the expense of slight extra drag. Today, aircraft are being designed to fly at speeds far above their critical Mach numbers. Problems of extra drag and loss of control caused by shock waves are being overcome. But for many years ahead, airliners will cruise below their critical Mach numbers. In this way, 
they will avoid shock waves altogether and attain long range and economy of operation. At the same time, designers will aim to make critical Mach numbers as high as possible, thus permitting passenger flight at speeds approaching the speed of sound. <laughs> 